Hi, and welcome to the first episode of our new Frequently Asked Questions series on immersion cooling solutions. My name is Amelia Coverdale, and I'm part of the marketing team at Asperitas. We've been consolidating questions we get regularly from events and online inquiries, and we're eager to get those answers out there. Throughout the year, we will be releasing new episodes on specific topics such as sustainability or solutions with partners, so watch this space. Let me first introduce our speakers for today. Michael Baricius, Business Development Manager at Asperitas, and Sandeep Kamath, Global Marketing Manager for Process Oils at Shell. Welcome, guys. Thank you, Emilia. Thanks, Emilia. You're very welcome. So let's dive right in, shall we, with the first question. Um, Michael, I believe this first one is for you. This is a basic one that's good to begin with. On you go. What is immersion cooling? Right. Yeah, so um, immersion cooling is an IT cooling practice uh, by which uh, IT components and other electronics, including actually complete server systems, are submerged in a dielectric uh, fluid that has a significantly higher thermal conductivity than air. Um, heat is removed from the system by circulating the fluid um, into direct contact with all the hot components and then usually through uh, water-cooled heat exchangers. Um, this advanced cooling method will enable you to facilitate high density and powered compute systems in an energy efficient manner. Thanks for that, Michael. Now into question two. What are the benefits and use cases for immersion cooling? Sandeep, if you could start on this one and Michael, you can always chip in. Yeah, sure. Um, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, right? And uh, I, I would say, you know, uh, myriad uh, a number of benefits, actually. In fact, you know, I can only see benefits that I, I really can't see any downsides. Uh, with immersion cooling, we believe you can actually reduce the footprint, uh, energy footprint of, a, of an average data center by almost half. You can increase the performance of, of the electronics, the performance of the CPU uh, uh, in the data centers also by you know, a, a, a massive amount, 30, 40% increase in the performance. Uh, you can also uh, reduce actually the capex and the opex of a data center depending on how big the data center is, just, just because you don't need all of the infrastructure that goes with, uh, uh, with you know, cooling off of a typical air-cooled uh, data center. Uh, you can actually reduce the geographical footprint of a data center also, and almost by up to 80%, uh, which is a big saving, right? Especially in uh, if, if your data center is located in, you know, expensive uh, uh, areas in cities, right? Then land is very expensive. Uh, also, you can reuse up to 99% of the heat that's generated by the electronics can be reused as 55 degrees hot water, yeah, which can be used for you know heating of the office spaces of nearby townships, but you know also as uh, as, as hot, hot water. Um, so yeah, all 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 benefits. I, I really don't know what is the downside, uh, but Michael, please please chip it. Yeah, so so maybe one to point out is uh, that you can use immersion cooling uh, and drastically also reduce your water consumption as a data center. So today, um, energy efficient air cooled. Uh, data centers they actually uh, usually um, use a lot of water as well for their systems and uh, this can be a real downside and as well limiting um, for example uh, the locations where data centers can be located so that's a that's a great benefit and as well uh, Emilia, i believe uh, the, the second part of the question was about the use cases um, and we see them in basically any vertical uh, kind of market for for data centers and and different types of users um, including telecom providers um, enterprise uh, um, data centers, um, massive cloud providers uh, are looking into immersion cooling. And of course, uh, which is more natural fit, high performance computing on different levels, right? Well, thank you to you both. That's all very interesting indeed. Um, let's proceed to the next question. What kind of fluid is used? Now, this one's for you, Sandeep. Yes, definitely. Um, no, so the name of our fluid uh, that we have actually co-developed together with Aspritas is a Shell Immersion Cooling Fluid S5X. Uh, it is a synthetic single phase fluid. And, you know, we have actually designed this specifically for uh, immersion cooled data servers and um, uh, specifically with, with the Aspritas server in mind. So it, it actually performs 
very well um, you know for convection servers the aspirator server module doesn't have any pumps but it can also be used uh, you know for pump based servers because that the actu actually the you know design specifications are exceeding you know what is required for pumps so it exceeds the ocp specification uh, the fluid uses a shell uh, patented uh, gtl technology which is gas to liquids and you know in very simple terms uh, how i can uh, how i can describe it you know to a layman is we basically take methane molecules out of the ground so you know natural gas and we put them together to make the molecule that we need you know so you can imagine you know taking small pieces of lego blocks and putting them together to make the toy you need right so that's that's basically what we do so the fluid is you know absolutely pure there are no impurities at all um, uh, you know it has very high cooling efficiency excellent flow behavior and excellent uh, thermodynamic properties so in 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 one one sentence i would say you know it it's the perfect fluid for for immersion cooling uh, of data centers well, thank you, Sandeep. Um, and on the topic of the fluid, and the next question is one that we get a lot and one that Michael can answer very well. And it's actually regarding how the fluid is circulated. So how is the fluid circulated, being circulated in the immersion cooling solution? Michael. All right, yeah. That's indeed the question we get a lot at trade shows, of course, um, even when people see the solution. Um, and before I go into that, maybe just to add on uh, Sunip's answer of, of the previous question on the type of fluid. One thing I think is really important to point out that this fluid has been developed for data centers specifically, right? So it's also meeting all of the safety requirements data centers have on to the highest level standards. Um, but now about the circulation, as you can see on this image um, in an abstract way, um, in, in general, single phase immersion cooling um, and also the aspirator solution is part of single phase immersion cooling, requires circulation of the dielectric uh, fluid um, either by pumps or in another way. Um, in aspirator systems, we use uh, what we call natural convection. Um, we use the flow basically generated by the hot components in the fluid um, to uh, to transfer the heat elsewhere. In our case, to integrated heat, heat exchangers, which are water cooled. Um, so they capture all of the heat being generated within the system. Um, and that makes this natural convection driven system actually very reliable as we don't use any pumps, um, but also very predictable um, exactly where flow is needed, the components is generating basically the, the flow itself. Um, but also it has climate uh, benefits. Um, because of this reason, we don't uh, mix all the fluid in this, uh, in this system to an average low temperature, but we build layers of different temperatures where we keep um, the components that we need to uh, basically protect and keep safe. We keep them in a colder zone, whereas the, the hot uh, part of the fluid is basically going to the surface where it's being cooled down. Um, this, this increases the delta T within the system and allows for warm water cooling. Um, so all of our systems are uh, ready to cool basically with a 45 um, uh, degrees um, Celsius hot water. Um, so even in high ambient temperatures, we can use free cooling. Um, so that's a, that's a huge advantage at the same time. Um, this uh, this natural convection enables us to deliver heat on a very high value uh, grade as well outside of data centers. Um, so there are different benefits for different use cases, um, but on the more uh, yeah practical level, it requires uh, no moving parts in the system. So it's a very reliable and low maintenance uh, system as well. Wow, all makes sense. Um, great. So let's go on to the next question. Sandeep, I believe this one would be for you. Um, do you need to replace this fluid? Right. No, that's a, that's a very important question, right? Um, in 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 one word, no. Uh, so you don't need to replace the fluid as long as uh, the purity of the fluid is is maintained, so it's not contaminated. You know, during um, uh, I don't know normal maintenance operations or so on. So. So our fluid is, as I mentioned, you know, it's it's uh, GTL based. You know, we make it uh, from methane, and it's basically a synthetic fluid. It's it's not a fluorocarbon based fluid, so it's not a two phase fluid. It's a single phase fluid, so it doesn't it doesn't evaporate under normal operating uh, conditions. So you know, it, it it won't sort of escape and just disappear from uh, from your server module. So it will be there as long as you know you uh, you 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 keep it enclosed and keep it uh, you know uh, uh, clean and and in a safe way. Um, yeah, so so in, it it should last for the lifetime of the data center. Uh, we have actually performed uh, you know 
uh, a number of lab tests on on the fluid uh, i i told you that you know this has been co developed with uh, with aspiritas you know we have tested the fluid uh, and actually there have also been deployments you know dating back to several years uh, from which we have sort of made projections you know on the uh, um, reliability of the fluid and on the performance and stability of the fluid and you you know we we don't see any need to replace the fluid during the lifetime of of the data server Thanks, Sandeep. That does clarify a lot. Back to you, Michael, with this next question. Um, this, again, is one that we get quite often, indeed. Um, can I service the IT hardware that has been immersed? Yeah. Yeah, it follows up on the, on the question, uh, basically, uh, uh, prior to this one. Um, so as you can see, actually, on this, uh, on this video, um, surfacing uh, can be done on IT hardware that has been immersed. Um, so that's the short answer. Yes, you can. Um, but uh, we also train our customers and users uh, to do so because the environment is different and the way of servicing is also different, right? Um, but in general, uh, we uh, basically offer surface tooling, including this surface trolley, which you see here in action, uh, which enables you to, uh, in a very clean and uh, simple manner, you can um, basically uh, take out components, uh, server solutions uh, to replace components and update them and upgrade them, but also to transport, as you can see, uh, systems in your data center. Um, so this whole service tooling portfolio is, is designed um, around uh, yeah, oper operational aspects, right? To keep it very simple, clean and straightforward. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess your answer. Yes, you can. And we prepare our users for doing so as well. That all seems quite straightforward. Thank you, Michael. The next question we have, that would be going back to Sandeep. Now, Sandeep, what can you say about the sustainability of the fluid? Sure, no, that's that's a very important question, right? And that's that's a, actually at the heart of uh, what Shell is actually trying to do in, in in terms of sustainability and and climate change. So, as I mentioned, the the fluid is uh, made from methane molecules uh, from natural gas, right? So it does come from the ground. Uh, so it's it's not it's not a vegetable or plant based uh, fluid. Uh, however, we don't burn the fluid, right? So it does not contribute to the CO2 in the atmosphere. So all of the fluid is uh, meant to be in, in the data server. So it has no you know, greenhouse uh, warming potential. Uh, also, the small CO2 footprint uh, of the fluid you know, in manufacturing the fluid in producing these molecules can be offset. So we have a solution, uh, you know, a nature-based solution where we can offset even that small CO2 footprint of manufacturing uh, the fluid. Uh, we can also offer, um, you know, uh, an end of life fluid collection and, and recycling uh, in, in our integrated offer. Um, if, you know, that helps uh, the customers. So, yeah, uh, hopefully that, that, uh, that gives you an idea. You know, I would, I would say it's, 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 it's very sustainable and that's, that's at the heart of, of our uh, value proposition. Yes, that does answer the question. That's good to know, Sandeep, and thanks for clarifying that one. The next couple of questions are actually both for you, Michael. Um, there's a couple here that you'd be able to answer very well. And the first one being, can I run immersion cooling systems in any data center? Right. Um, yeah. So again, uh, yes, you can run immersion cooling systems in any data center. Um, in fact, we designed our uh, immersion cooling uh, solution in such way that it meeting all the requirements, um, even of T4 data centers. Um, and they have been also validated for that purpose. Um, so to make it very general, we need three uh, different um, interface connections and uh, two of them are very familiar to data centers. The first one is connectivity and the second one is power, of course. And thirdly, we need uh, access to uh, a water cooled um, uh, supply basically um, can be uh, an existing cooling infrastructure based on water or um, a separate independent um, infrastructure for uh, for water supply. But those are the three elements we need. Uh, water supply um, being that the closed loop system, so we don't need access to water uh, continuously as in consumption, but we, we use water um, and then power and, and data connectivity, of course. And then you can run it in any kind of data center. Um, we have done so also and, uh, and continue to do so, of course, in different environments, um, existing uh, location facilities of the highest standards, again, up to tier four, um, but 
also containerized solutions and um, and very other uh, different kind of use cases um, in existing buildings, for example, and never designed as a data center. Um, so I would say that the, the opportunities are limitless if it comes to where you deploy uh, our technology. Nice. Okay. Well, we've got a follow-on question um, from that, Michael. Um, we have this one here that came in. Can I use standard hardware? Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is, is very, uh, very important, of course, because immersion cooling is is existing to facilitate and support and protect, um, yeah, uh, your IT investment, right, in the hardware, which can be significant, um, and this should be taken very seriously and and treated with care and all of our product design, but also our processes as a company are designed uh, to do that, basically, to ensure the reliability and the performance on the long uh, on the long term. Um, so standard hardware um, is originally designed for air cooling in, in most cases, right? Um, but we strongly believe that it can be optimized for immersion cooling. Um, so to keep this quite simple, we use standard components, uh, processors as you know, the motherboards as you know them, uh, but there are some, some components in standard servers that we don't need, for example, fans. Um, they have no use in immersion and, uh, and, uh, and as well in some cases, we believe that we can optimize components for immersion specifically and uh, either we do so ourselves or together with OEM partners specialized in, in certain components like uh, cables or um, yeah, specific boards. Um, so that's what we do together with OEMs. We have a standard process for that as well, what we call a certification process. So every system that's being immersed in our technology has been validated and certified through this process. And we do this um, actually for OEMs and integrators. Um, and um, yeah, and that's also now the, the enabling factor to provide immersion ready servers that are available today, um, right? So um, you can buy them and uh, they have been uh, basically in our system and in our process uh, for quite some time. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you for explaining that one, Michael. Back to you, Sandeep, for this next one. We have, how important is material compatibility in immersion cooling developments or applications? Yeah, that's it. It is very important. Um, you know, I can't, uh... I can't overstate how important material compatibility is. Um, so it's very important to prevent any degradation, corrosion, or damage to expensive uh, IT equipment uh, that is in, in your data center, right? So um, our fluid, shell immersion cooling fluid S5X, um, is specifically engineered for immersion cooling of the electronics, um, and which is co-developed with Aspritas. Uh, it's a GTL based fluid. It's, you know, very high uh, purity standards. Um, uh, you know, it's because we basically make the molecules that we need. It doesn't come from crude. So it doesn't have, you know, any sulfur or, or um, you know, nitrogen oxides or, or aromatics or anything that can then react with the, with the equipment. Um, so I would say, you know, our, our fluid is, um, you know, probably if we just throw out a number 99, you know, uh, compatible with 99% of, of materials and, uh, and, you know, does not react with, 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 with most of them, uh, you know, so uh, the high server reliability and, and lifetime is sort of almost guaranteed. Very interesting. Thank you, Sandeep. Now, this next one, I feel, will be of particular interest. And Michael, it would be one for yourself. Um, how easy or flexible is it to actually deploy immersion cooled systems? And Sandeep, you could perhaps jump in on this one if you feel necessary. Thank you. Yeah, so this, uh, this of course, ties in with the previous question about um, if immersion cooling can be deployed in any kind of data center. Um, so partly this has been answered, but beyond existing data centers, um, immersion cooling is offering a lot of flexibility. Um, in terms of requirements for the facility, uh, as I mentioned, it's very low. We, we just need three connections. But that means also that you can um, basically deploy the system in an existing building and office space, um, but also in other, for example, um, more modular and containerized solutions. And we have seen some very exciting uh, new ideas of where to deploy an immersion cooling uh, system, right? 
Um, so it can be done in existing data centers with existing white space as you know them with waste floors and, and bus bars and IO containments. Um, the environment is of no impact for immersion cooling. That's the beauty of it. And immersion cooling doesn't need to impact uh, their environment as well. Um, so we have designed the system such way, for example, uh, very well insulated. So it's hardly uh, dissipating any heat in the room. Um, so that allows for a hybrid form as well. Um, so it's very flexible again, um, as well in terms of climate independency, as I mentioned, um, natural convection driven immersion cooling allows for warm water cooling. Um, and that opens the door to uh, deploy data centers, um, for example, closer to end uses where the climate environment is maybe not ideal for traditional cooling. Um, so that's, that's again, um, you, ha you have a lot more flexibility with immersion cooling. Um, I always like to say that with immersion cooling, you can basically um, standardize efficiency um, across the board and in any location. Um, and that's, that's quite interesting from an infrastructure and operational um, perspective, of course. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, Sandeep, was there anything you would like to add to this one? Um, no, Michael has covered it beautifully. I, yeah, I mean, from a you know simple person's uh, pers perspective, I could just say you know that we we are deploying uh, the Aspritas um, solution in in our uh, high performance computing uh, data center in in Amsterdam. It's an existing you know cluster, and you know we are deploying it it it, it in, in an existing data center. I have seen uh, Aspritas deployments in a in a shipping container outside. You know, so yeah, it's uh, I would say at least from my perspective, it's it's super flexible. Yeah, yeah, even tier four environments um, for for a financial institute, of course, but also, uh, for example, for a department of a university without any data center, and they just wanted to have a lot of compute power on site, um, and then yeah, that's where immersion cooling again comes in. Um, that will make that very simple and straightforward to do so. Wow, exciting, brilliant. Okay, we're on to the last question, which you can both contribute to actually, but perhaps mm. Michael, um, you could kick us off with this one. Why is immersion cooling gaining momentum now? Yeah, so that's uh, this is interesting, right? So um, I've been with Esperitas now um, four years. Um, so I also have seen uh, quite a development in terms of awareness and momentum for immersion cooling over the last few years. And uh, something um, yeah, is really changing um, at the moment, but uh, already the last few months, where the challenges for data centers uh, are becoming more and uh, more clear, actually. Um, and that, uh, that are challenges basically in different kind of um, categories. Um, the first one definitely is sustainability and climate change aspects. So at the same time, the requirements for data centers to, uh, to become as sustainable as they can get are increasing, um, even, even leading to regulations and policies in some data center regions. Uh, but at the same time as well, data centers are required to be anywhere. Um, that means across different climate zones and in some cases, very challenging environments uh, to operate data centers with air cooling. Um, so those are two more climate, let's say, um, yeah, uh, aspects that are driving the momentum. And then there is this uh, technical, technical driver where we see an increase in uh, performance and, and high powered uh, hardware and, and rising TDPs, right? And that's the technical reason uh, advanced cooling is basically um, yeah, developing very fast now. Um, so different reasons, um, ah, yeah, as you can see here, um, different challenges, a lot of them are sustainable related, um, as well the objectives for data centers changed um, from energy efficiency alone to uh, climate neutral as a goal. Uh, we see almost every um, uh, hyperscale cloud provider um, yeah, uh, defining their climate neutrality goals. Um, and then there are a lot of trends um, data centers actually are also uh, facilitating or need to respond to, uh, for example, edge computing and uh, a lot of innovations going to data centers. Um, so a lot of good reasons to look into immersion cooling uh, solutions today and, and explore if this is a solution that can add value for your organization, right? And Sandeep, what's your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think Michael covered, you know, most of them beautifully. I'll, I'll just put a little bit of a, you know, customer angle on it as well. Uh, uh, at least from my participation in, in OCP and Shell has been an OCP Platinum member since it's August, but we've been participating at OCP for quite some time. And, you know, from our discussions with, um, with, with end customers, with, you know, data center owners, uh, we see that actually the, at, at least the leading, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
cloud providers they have been actually testing this technology for quite some time now uh, to make sure that you know it it performs uh, as expected and you know there are no uh, uh, surprises you know no negative surprises going on because again it's expensive it that you know you are immersing in a in a in a different medium than than air which people are you know normally used to and you know more and more of them are now believing it in it because they've seen it perform right so uh, i think that's also one of the reasons we think that this is going to gain traction very fast and uh, yeah i think i think the time is uh, yeah it's uh, the time is just ripe now for it yeah yeah maybe just the last uh, last words on that emilia and uh, then i know we need to close this session but um, i also like to refer as well to uh, to institutes like uptime institute and ashray for example leading standardization bodies and and their message if you read their uh, recent reports is um, this is the time to prepare for advanced cooling and and liquid cooling technologies um, and uh, we're here to help you um, so we have uh, now quite some experience with uh, supporting techno technology roadmaps uh, with, with different organizations um, so uh, Shell and Aspiratus I think we're fully prepared to, uh, to support this uh, exploration and see uh, where this technology can add value right. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Nice. Um, okay. Well, yeah, as you said, Michael, we're, we've come to the end of our uh, frequently asked questions and um, first webinar. Um, thanks to you both for participating. And um, yeah, I really look forward to many more. And uh, also thank you to the listeners and viewers. I hope this has provided some clarity and it's a good base for any further questions that you may have. Speaking of which, if anyone does have any more questions, please refer to both the Asperitas and Shell websites, which you can see here. Both sites have a wide range of materials like white papers and brochures on the joint proposition between Asperitas and Shell. You can also request online demonstrations to discuss the integrated technology in more depth. Lastly, feel free to connect with both Michael and Sandeep on LinkedIn, if you wish. But um, that's all from me. That's all from us. And um, thanks again um, to you, Michael and Sandeep, and see you at the next episode. Yeah, thank you as well, Emilia. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. Yeah, indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you.